Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So today, Mr. Rafi, we start with verse 190 of Surah Baqarah. And in this case, Allah is saying, fight in the way of Allah. Fight those who fight you, but do not transgress. Allah does not like the transgressors. Kill them wherever you overtake them. Expel them from wherever they have expelled you. And fitna is worse than killing. And do not fight them at Al-Masjid Al-Haram until, you f- until they fight you there. But if they fight you, then kill them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. And if they stop, if they cease, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. Fight them until there is no more fitna. And until worship is acknowledged to be for Allah. But if they cease, then there is to be no more aggression except against the oppressors. <clears throat> now the problem is that with these verses, these verses have been the most misconstrued by many people. Um, suggesting that what Allah is saying over here is go and fight and kill people. Okay? When in fact what Allah is making very clear is that kital, battle. Fi uh, Sabilillah is important, and in this case, it was being targeted towards those who were oppressing the Muslims. Okay, so this was a defense strategy. It was it was not offensive; it was defensive. The Muslims were being told, "You have an ummah. Now you have an army, and now there is no more. Uh, there's no need to show sabr now when people are attacking you and they're trying to kill you. Now you attack back." Okay, so the most important thing is that what the what the Quraysh did was, even though the Muslims are out of Makkah, they are in Medina, they have their own thing now. They're not bothering you, right? But why were the Quraysh still so desperate to attack the Muslims and completely destroy them? Because they were uh, they were afraid that uh, that if he did not uh, in the future of Muhammad and his and his you know. Uh, uh, the the other Muslim will become too strong and they might take the power away from them. Right, because <clears throat> the Quraysh were also called the what? The, the keepers of the Kaaba. Keepers of the Kaaba. And so they were terrified that if Islam starts to spread, then eventually it's going to take over uh, the entire Arabia. Our power as keepers of the Kaaba is going to be taken away from us. So we have to destroy the Muslims. We have to extinguish Islam. And so initially the Muslims were told that you show sabr, when there was oppression taking place in Makkah, they were not told fight, they were told sabr, it's okay, sabr. Now they're being told that a lot of time has passed, so now when they try and fight you or attack you, now you don't stop. Now it's going to be, a, it's a defensive strategy. Now it's not offensive. Offensive means that, um, you know, there are uh, different Arab tribes who are non-Muslims, and you have a peace treaty with them. So they're not saying anything to you, but you decide to simply go and uh, you know attack them and take over. That's not what the Muslims are being told. They're told when they attack you and when they try and oppress you, okay, now you attack and you fight back. You only fight in defense. And that's why Allah says over here, do not transgress because Allah does not like the transgressors. So fighting is being prescribed right now only to defend yourselves. And so, so and that's why Allah says that you can kill them wherever you overtake them. Get them out from wherever they have taken you out. Because fitna is worse than fighting. The oppression and torture that was imposed upon you, which forced you out of Makkah, that was unfair and that is worse than fighting. Now, why is Allah even saying this? Because many of the Muslims uh, were terrified when these verses came. So when the command for fighting came, they were actually scared because first of all, they said, well, uh, Islam has always been about peaceful preaching, right? So why is Allah suddenly commanding us to fight? Because if fight, they will, there will be bloodshed. People will be killed. Isn't murder or isn't killing people bad? And then on top of that, they were also scared that uh, I might end up losing my own life, right? I might have to sacrifice my life now. Peaceful preaching was easy, it was fine, but now I might have to sacrifice my life on the battlefield. That was scary for, for Muslims who had weak iman. And then most importantly, the people who had migrated from Makkah to Medina. Now when they are being told that you fight the, the people of Quraysh because they keep trying to attack you, 
They were scared that when I'm fighting on the battlefield, I might have to face my father, who's a kafir, my brother, who's a kafir, my uncle, who's a kafir. What if I end up killing my father? What if I end up killing my own brother or my own son? How is this allowed in Islam? If a son kills his father, how is that allowed in Islam? Right? And so Allah is saying, fitna is worse than fighting. Yes, fighting and bloodshed, these are things that are not promoted in Islam. Violence is not promoted at all in Islam. But Allah is saying, fitna is worse. Fitna is the fact that these people oppressed you for 12 years, tortured you just because you wanted to worship one God, just because you wanted to follow one prophet. You said nothing to them but they made your lives miserable. Then they forced you to leave Makkah. And when you left Makkah, they took over your houses, your property and your land. So basically when the Muslims, when the Muhajireen left Makkah to Medina, they had nothing. They had to borrow clothes. They had to borrow everything from the people of Ansar. And all of this was being done. Why? Simply because they wanted to believe in one God and they wanted to uh, follow Muhammad peace be upon him. So Allah is saying that is something as a Muslim... Uh, initially Allah said, okay, forgive and overlook. Now there is no forgiveness. Now if they continue attacking you, get ready. It's time for you to attack back. This is the beautiful thing about Muslims now that me and you have to understand. When you see someone being oppressed, as a Muslim ummah, it's your responsibility to take up arms against them. You don't sit and watch and say, well, okay, maybe I'll do peaceful preaching. Maybe they might stop. If oppression is taking place, if women or children are being oppressed, if men are being oppressed who are your Muslim brothers and sisters, you fight. Because that is the thing is to show the enemy that as a Muslim, you're not weak. And another thing that's very important is that uh, when you look at the way Allah dealt with all of the nations in the past as well, he always gives them a certain amount of time where they are oppressing and torturing and being unfair, but the Prophet and the believers are being told, wait, 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 show sabr, mm. right? You can see the same with Bani Israel under Musa alayhi salam. But it was only after that period of time is over, now Allah says, okay, no more waiting. They have been given enough time, now you have to stand up for yourselves. And so this is why again in verse 193, Allah is reinforcing that fight them until there is no more fitna, there is no more persecution, and only there is a worship of Allah, but if they stop, so they stop aggression towards you, they stop trying to kill you and planning and conspiring against you, then you need to stop as well. Okay, so there is no need for any aggression except against the oppressors. So if the oppression stops, then you stop. Okay, and don't forget this is the early commands that are being given. Later on, you'll see that the strategy of this as well changes. So the Muslim army goes from defensive to offensive. offensive. Now the entire strategy has changed because now an Islamic empire has to be built. Every corner of the world needs to get a chance to hear the message of Islam. All right? Then verse 194 and 195, Allah says, fighting in the sacred month is... Um, is for aggression committed in the sacred month. And for all violations is legal retribution. So whoever has assaulted you, assault him in the same way that he has assaulted you. Fear Allah, know that Allah is with those who fear him. Spend in the way of Allah. Do not throw yourselves with your own hands into destruction. And do good. Allah loves the doers of good. In the period of, um, of ignorance, pre-Islamic period, now, Muhammad, peace be upon him, had not yet come. They were still worshipping idols. But the Arabs said that there are four months in which fighting will cease throughout Arabia. So as I told you, outside of Mecca, there was constant fighting. If you took your caravan and you had to travel somewhere, very likely that somebody would attack you. Unless your caravan belonged to Quraysh, keepers of the Kaaba. Now, the Arabs said there's a problem. We fight so much. Our tribes are attacking each other in the entire Arab region so much that in the month of Hajj, when people are supposed to come all the way to Mecca and they're supposed to perform Hajj, how can they do that when they are, you know, when it's easy for them to be attacked? If, if, they, if they will easily be attacked, then who's going to walk all the way to Mecca to perform Hajj? They don't have airplanes. They don't have cars. 
They have to come on horses or on camels or on foot. And for the people of Quraysh, why was it essential to make it easy for people to come and perform Because Hajj? Because they wanted the fame and population of people are coming there and, and acknowledging them of the, the Kibar of the Kaaba and that they can get a, 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 the, the highest status in trade. They can get a lot of status, yes, because people and will come. And they probably charged money for And you get a lot of money, right? That is what mission. makes it a religious and a financial hub. Meaning the main city, because everyone comes there to perform Hajj, you make a lot of money. And if you stop them from coming or if they, if they just cannot come because there's so much bloodshed, how will you become rich? So it was announced that the months surrounding the month of Hajj, which includes Zul Qada, Zul Hijjah, Muharram, Rajab. In these four months, fighting is prohibited. So this is pre-Islamic period. This is ignorance period. Even then they said in these four months, fighting is prohibited. Okay. But now what is something that uh, the, Ar the Arab tribes would do is they would say, okay, four months fighting is prohibited. Sometimes they would play this trick. If they really wanted to attack another tribe, they would attack the tribe during one of these prohibited months. And then later on, they would say, okay, um, you know, we have to make up because we, there has to be four months in the entire year in which fighting is prohibited. So this year, we did not choose Zul Qada, Zul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. We chose another four months. So this was um, a loophole that they had come up with so that they could fight during those forbidden months. You know, so that the other tribe is not fighting you because it's a forbidden month. But you tell them, oh, well, we changed our for forbidden months this year. So we guys, we will fight. Okay, now when Islam was introduced, Allah said the four months, Zul Qada, Zul Hijjah, Muharram, Rajab, this continues. This continues in Islam as well, because during the months of Hajj, you have to make it easy for people to come to perform Hajj. But now Allah is saying, no fighting, but if somebody fights you during this time and violates that sacred month, you can fight back. Okay, and so whoever assaults you, now you assault them in the same way that they assaulted you. Now, you don't see forgiveness. Now, can you see the verses are changing? It's not like, okay, it doesn't matter, forgive, overlook, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Now, you take revenge. And this is very important as a Muslim. You need to know when to show forgiveness and when to take revenge. And especially when there is killing, assault, oppression, injustice, then there's no like, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I'll just do sabr and I'll hope things get better. Then you take a stand because Allah says, I've not made you weak. I've made you strong. Okay. And the beautiful thing about a Muslim is that a Muslim should incite fear in the eyes of the enemy. You know, like Khalid bin Walid, Hazrat Umar, people at the enemy was terrified. Just hearing their names, they were terrified because they knew these people are so just and fair. That if we go against them or if we do some injustice and we find out, guess who's coming for you? Khalid bin Walid is coming for you. Or Hazrat Umar is coming for you. People were like terrified. You get it? Mm -hmm. um, and so and Allah is also now encouraging spend, spend, spend. Not just zakat, but go beyond your zakat. Why? Because now you have to build your army. You have to buy weapons. You have to buy cavalry. You have to improve the army. If Muslims start to hold their money, give out 2.5% zakat, and that's it, no more, then how will you build the, uh, build the army? This is fee sabil Allah, right? So the Muslims are being groomed. They all have come from the period of, of uh, ignorance where you don't give out a lot in charity. Mm -hmm. So now they're being constantly told, give out. It's very important for you. Do not withhold your hands, otherwise you will destroy your own selves. Because on the day of judgment, it'll be too late. Then in verse 196, Allah says, And complete the Hajj and Umrah for Allah, but if you are prevented, then offer what can be obtained with ease of sacrificial animals. Do not shave your heads until the sacrificial animal has reached its place of slaughter. And whoever among you is ill or has an ailment of the head, uh, which means you have to now shave your head even though your sacrificial animal has not reached the place of slaughter, then a ransom of fasting, Uh, or charity or sacrifice is important. And when you are secure, then whoever performs Umrah, followed by Hajj, 
um, offers what can be obtained with ease of sacrificial animals. And whoever cannot find or afford such an animal fast of three days during the Hajj and seven days when you return home. Those are 10 days in total. This is for those whose family is not in the area of Al-Masjid Al-Haram and fear Allah and know that Allah is severe in penalty. Um, now, first of all, let me explain what this is. Um, since now Allah is, is explaining all of the, the rituals and the rites all over again, because um, the, the Arabs during the period of ignorance, they were doing Hajj, they were doing Umrah, but I told you they had made a lot of distortions. So Allah had to reintroduce everything from scratch. And so um, he was telling uh, the, the Arabs that first of all, if you are on your way to perform Umrah and Hajj, some obstacle has come in your way and you can now no longer complete it. Like in the case of Hudaybiyah, when they put on their ihram, they were going for Umrah, but they were, they were prevented from entering. Ab, your niyat has been made that I'm going, but something happened along the way and you were not able to go. At that point, Allah says that take your sacrificial animal, because at the end of the Umrah, the Hajj, you have to sacrifice an animal, right? So Allah is saying, since now you cannot perform the Umrah or the Hajj, then you have to give your sacrificial animal to the place of sacrifice, wait for it to be sacrificed, and once it is sacrificed, then, you know, shave your head like we do in Umrah as well as in Hajj. The, the men especially shave their heads. Now, in the case of Hudaybiyah, for instance, or generally, if you are not able to complete the Umrah or the Hajj, what happens is you give your sacrificial animal, the animal you've chosen for sacrifice, to somebody else. Then you, Then that person will take it to the place where it has to be sacrificed. And once it is sacrificed, once it has reached that place, then you can shave your head. Now, nowadays you have uh, phones, so they can call and tell you. At that time, they didn't have phones. So you had to just approximate or estimate that I think by now, my animal should have reached a place of sacrifice given where I am, right? Uh, you know, it was easy to kind of calculate the distance and you, you could approximate. And then after that number of days, then you can shave your head. Okay, but if for some reason you have an ailment, some kind of a disease in your scalp, and that requires you to immediately shave your head. In that situation, Allah is saying that you can go ahead and shave it, but as a result, a ransom has to be given, which is fasting, or you will uh, have to feed the poor, or you have to offer an additional sacrifice. And according to the Hadith, what is mentioned is that the Muslim has to fast for three days, or he has to feed six poor people, or he has to slaughter an, a, another animal. Okay? Two animals. Right. So there was one animal that he had sent, but because he ended up shaving his head before the animal reached the place, he has to offer now another animal for sacrifice. And furthermore, in this, in this verse, what you will see is there was another problem, and that was the fact that um, during the ignorance period, the Arabs said, if your niyat is to go for Umrah, then go for Umrah, and now suddenly, if you decide that, okay, I walked all the way from my tribe to Makkah, of course, you know, they didn't have cars. So sometimes it was a journey of two or three months. And by the time they arrived there, they realized that, oh, now it's time for Hajj. The month of Hajj has started. So we came for Umrah. We have performed the Umrah. Why don't we wait a little bit longer than the, the month of Hajj is starting? We can also do our Hajj and then go all the way back right? because it's hard to keep coming. And in the pre-Islamic period, ignorance period, the Arabs had said, no, that's not right. You cannot do that. If you come for Umrah, you do Umrah, tough luck, go all the way back and then come again for Hajj. And of course, that, that would mean that you've missed your Hajj because it takes you months to, uh, to go and to come back. Right. And so now Allah was introducing a way out for them. If you have come with the niyat of Umrah. But now you've realized that while I'm here, the month of Hajj is also about to start. You want to stay longer. So you want to extend your Umrah into a Hajj. Allah is saying you can do that. All you have to do is provide uh, an animal for sacrifice. So you have to sacrifice an animal. If you cannot afford sacrificing an animal, then you have to fast for three days during the Hajj and seven days when you go back home. You know, once you've completed the Hajj and, and you've gone back home, which makes 10 days in total. So now Allah is providing uh, an easy way out. All right. Then verse 197, Allah is saying Hajj is during the well-known months. Whoever has made Hajj obligatory upon himself. So now he's going with the niyat of Hajj. There should be for him 
no disobedience, no disputing du during the Hajj, and no sexual relations. And, to, and whatever good you do, Allah knows it, take provisions. But indeed, the best provision is the fear of God and fear me or you of understanding. So what Allah is teaching these people is in the ignorance period, they said, okay, Hajj, you go over there. You basically have to, you know, there are certain things you have to do like Tawaf and then you have to go between uh, Safa and, and Marwa. Then you have to go to Minna, so on and so forth. And you have to go to uh, Arafat. These are certain things that we have to do. But they forgot that, yes, besides these rites and these rituals, your spirituality is very important. If you're busy talking and, and backbiting, gossiping, uh, doing harm to other people, or if you, uh, if you get involved in marital relations, or if you get involved in things like sexual relations, then the spirit is gone, right? It's like, you know, when you do namaz. Namaz is not just going up and down and up and down like an exercise. There is a spirit of that namaz. Fasting is not about just, you know, starve yourself the whole day, right? It's about understanding how, why you're doing this and how you're taming your nafs and how you're using this to improve your taqwa and get close to Allah. Hajj is the ultimate sacrifice that you're making. You're far away from home. If there's no luxury or comfort over there, you have to spend, uh, you have to do all of the rites and, and the rituals of, of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Sometimes it's very, very hard, very difficult, very hot. And you have to endure all of that. And while that, control yourself. So when there are thousands of people in uh, at the Kaaba, you know, sometimes people might push you. Sometimes people might say something. There's, there's a huge crowd. Control yourself. Don't you find this a, as a miracle that... Normally, when you have a mob, when you have a crowd somewhere, one person does something wrong and it incites a, a anger and suddenly like people are fighting each other and, you know, beating each other up, right? This happens so many times. Isn't it amazing that every single year in the Kaaba, hundreds and thousands go there for Hajj and you have, unfortunately, people who do bad things like, you know, they'll push someone or, you know, they'll be a mean to someone, but everyone is calm nobody ends up losing it. Like nobody ends up uh, beating each other up or physically fighting or, or anything like that. Everyone is calm because they understand that we are here for the sake of Allah. We really have to hope and pray that Allah accepts our Hajj because Allah is saying, if you go all the way and you do everything, but at the same time you are fighting and you are being mean to other people and you are gossiping, your entire effort is wasted. You can come to me on the day of judgment and say, Allah, I performed Hajj, but I will say, sorry, Hajj was not accepted. Okay? And then Allah says um, in verse 198, 199, there is no blame upon you for seeking bounty from Allah during Hajj. But when you depart from Arafat, remember Allah as the uh, al mashr Al-Haram and remember Him as He has guided you. For indeed, you were before that amongst those who were astray. Then depart from the place from where all the people depart and ask forgiveness uh, of Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Now, this is really interesting because the people of Quraysh had said in the ignorance period that we are the keepers of the Kaaba. So during Hajj, all you other guys have to go to Arafat, but we don't have to because we are the special chosen tribe. We are the keepers of the Kaaba. So they would not go to Arafat. They would directly go to Muzdalfa after Mina. They would not even go to Arafat because they would say, there's no need for us. We are the keepers of the Kaaba. That's why Allah makes a special mention over here. He talks about Arafat. And not just that, he says, depart from the place where all people depart. So everyone goes to Arafat. And then everyone has to spend that entire day engaging in zikr. You have to do it too. It's there. It's a time for everyone because Arafat is the most important time of the Hajj. It is at Arafat that it is a reminder to you that all of us will be standing just like this, ready for the day of judgment to begin. Right? How is it that one tribe is being forgiven and, and being told, you guys don't have to do Arafat? Mm -hmm. Right? So this is what's being explained here. And Allah is giving them permission that if you want to do trade, seek bounty during Hajj, that's okay. Now, this was important at that time, especially because um, I told you that the people in Arabia, they couldn't grow crops. Their main way of earning money was how? 
Trade. Trade, right? Caravans and trade. Now, I told you that they don't have uh, cars or planes, so they have to walk all the way. They have to go on their camel. It sometimes takes months for them to get just to Mecca. But, so, uh, but on the day of uh, Hajj, uh, there are a lot of people from different tribes who have come there. So you can trade there instead of waiting. So you can trade there. So some people thought, okay, well, it's a great opportunity. I'm going for Hajj. I might as well just take my goods and trade. I mean, it's not like I can go to Mecca every other day. And so Allah was saying, no, fine, that's allowed. You can, but your primary intention should be Hajj. It should not, it should not be, I'm going for business. I might as well as do Hajj as well. Then your Hajj is not accepted. If but, you're saying uh, I'm going for Hajj, but okay, well, I, I have a couple of goods with me. I, maybe I can do some trading too. Then that's okay because your main intention is Hajj. What you see in this is Allah is creating so much ease for people. He could have said, no, it's for Hajj and that's it. No trading allowed. If you want to trade, go back and then come again. Do you understand? So there is so much ease in Islam. Now verses 200 onwards, Allah says, And when you have completed your rituals and rites, remember Allah like your, like your previous remembrance of your fathers or with much greater remembrance. And among the people is he who says, Our Lord, give us everything in this dunya. And Allah is saying, and he will have in the hereafter nothing. But among them, there are those who say, Allah, give us in this world that which is good. And you know this dua. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirate hasanatan. Wa kina azab al nar. And Allah protect us from the punishment of the fire. Allah is saying for them, they will have a share of what they have earned. And Allah is swift in account. Remember Allah during the specific number of days. Then whoever hastens in two days, there is no sin upon him. And whoever delays, there is no sin upon him. For him who fears Allah and fear Allah and know that unto him you will be gathered. So what Allah is saying over here is that now when you have done your rituals and rites, then spend your time engaging in the remembrance of your lord in a manner that is greater than how you used to remember your forefathers as well so in other words when you used to remember in the in the ignorance period the way you remembered your ancestors the way that you remembered your other gods and goddesses remember allah with even more zikr Again, the idea is to remind them, it's not just about, did you go to Mina? Did you go here? Did you go to Arafat? What about, what were you thinking? Were you connected with Allah throughout this time? Or were you just physically going here and there and here and there and that's it? Right? And now most importantly, Allah says, some what people... What do you mean by, were you were connected to Allah? In other words, while you were doing all these activities, <clears throat> were you engaging in the zikr of, uh, of Allah? Was your tongue moist with the zikr of Allah? Which means... You're constantly doing astaghfar. You're constantly praising Allah. You're constantly remembering all the amazing blessings Allah has given you. You're constantly thanking Him. Or are you are you just thinking, okay, I have to go here. Okay, fine. Now I have to go there. Oh, okay, after this I have to go there. But in your mind, you're not even thinking about God, about why you're even here, about what is the purpose of all these activities, Right? So that connection has to be important. Otherwise, it's just a physical exercise. That's it. It doesn't mean anything. And then Allah says, when people come to this Hajj and Umrah, some people say, Allah, give us this dunya. So in other words, in their dua, all they're saying is, Allah, please, please give me that promotion. Please give me excellent grades. Please give me this amazing house. Please give me that, that amazing, you know, the, the stuff that I was looking for. My Xbox, my hi-fi tools and my hi-fi hi toys. Uh, the most branded shoes, I really love those shoes, Allah, please give them to me. There are people who only, Allah says, ask me for dunya. Now what does Allah say? Okay, I'll give you dunya, but you will have no share in the hereafter? Is that what he says? Yeah. No. He says, and he will have in the hereafter no share. He doesn't say, I'll give you what you want, but then in the hereafter you get nothing. He's very careful about his words. He says, in the hereafter you get nothing, but in this dunya you will get as much as I have destined for you. So your risk has been written for you the day you were born. So Allah is saying, if you really, really ask me, Allah, please give me a million dollars. Allah, please give me like this massive mansion. You'll get it if it's destined for you and if it's not, then you won't. But guess what? 
there's one thing you're definitely not getting and that's akhirah because you didn't pray for it. Right? So people think, oh, I performed hajj. Oh, this is amazing. Alhamdulillah, this is great. Now my akhirah is definitely going to be, it, it, you know, it's saved. Well, number one, make sure that you have to hope that Allah accepted your hajj. Were you even connected with him? And number two, did you even ask Allah for your akhirah? Just going there does not mean that your akhirah is saved. Yes, but how do you know that, uh, that, that Allah accepted your hajj? Because if you don't know uh, well, and you did something wrong during the hajj, but you don't remember you doing that, so isn't that a bit unfair on the people who did it? Because they won't know if, if their hajj was accept, accepted or not. No one ever knows if anything of theirs has been accepted. That's why you live between fear and hope. Right? What Allah wants is struggle. What Allah wants is effort. I do my prayers five times a day. I don't even know if a single prayer is being accepted. But I try my best to focus as much as I can in the prayer. I have this fear that maybe I, it, it wasn't good enough, but I have this hope that Allah, I really do hope that you will accept it. But if I have 100% confidence, I did my prayer, I'm going to Jannah because I'm a five-time prayer person. That's overconfidence. Allah says, well, I didn't give you any guarantee. On the opposite side, if I just kill myself in fear and I say, oh, there's no point. Every prayer of mine is horrible. Allah is never going to accept this. I barely am able to focus. Then eventually I will kill myself in depression. And then I'll say, you know what? There's no point even doing the prayer. What's the point? It's hard for me to focus. Allah will never accept it. I'm destined for Jahannam. That is the opposite extreme, which Allah says, I don't like that either. So remain in the middle, balance. That balance gives you the effort that I need to improve, right? And at the same time, it gives you hope. Same as what Allah is saying in Hajj, did you at least try to focus? Did you at least try to stay away from bad things? Did you at least try to not gossip and, and do things that were wrong? And if you did gossip, the minute you remember, did you do tawbah and start to, you know, engage in zikr again? That's the effort is all that he's asking you for. And then what prayers did you make when you reached my house? Your prayer, the du'as that you make, are an indication of what's going on in your mind and how and what, is, what are you actually worshipping. You know that? So we all say we worship Allah, but then just look at your du'a. What is 90% of your du'a about? If it's about dunya, then what you're worshipping is dunya. Right? If, you, if it's about pleasing Allah, um, having trust in Allah, Allah please... Uh, grant me tawakkal. Allah, please grant me sabr. Allah, please do what you think is best for me. Allah, please, I really want this, but I'm not sure if it's good for me. So Allah, please, can you tell me if it's good for me and I trust you? Then what you see in your dua is that you're obsessed with Allah. So, so we're not supposed to ask for anything? No, you're supposed to ask for dunya and akhirah. Ask for both. Allah no, saying... No, but what if you, oh, oh, what if you ask like... Uh... Hold on, more, hold on. More dunya than you ask for Over here, Allah says, um, for those in the first case, they're only asking for dunya. So Allah says, okay, there's no akhirah for you. And for the second, he's saying, there are those who are saying, give us dunya, what is good in dunya, and give us what is good in the akhirah. So you're asking Allah for both. And that's okay. So in other words, in your dua, you're saying, Allah, uh, I really want these excellent grades. I really do want this job. I really do want this promotion. And that's all fine, provided, provided you're saying in this dua, give us dunya that is good for us. So Allah, I really want this job if it is good for me. Allah, I really want this amazing car and this amazing house and these amazing things if there is khair in it for me. Okay? And at the same time, you're saying, and Allah, akhirah, please. Make my time of barzakh easy. Please let the Qur'an be my guider uh, th throughout this dunya. Please let the Qur'an be there to help me as well when I'm standing in front of you on the Day of Judgment and I'm absolutely terrified. That is the kind of dua where Allah... That, then what does He say? Allah says, you, you will get a share of what you've earned. Can you see how amazing His words are? He doesn't say, oh, you asked me for dunya and akhirah. Okay, I'll give you dunya and akhirah. You'll get, you, he says, you'll get a share of what you've earned. So in terms of this dunya, you'll get as much as I've destined for you. In, but in terms of akhirah, you'll get what you deserve. What you deserve. So yeah. Allah's not making promises. He's not saying, okay, you asked me for akhirah, I'll give you akhirah. No, it has to be a day of, of justice. 
Allah is saying, you'll get as much as you strove for, as much as you worked hard for. Okay? And then Allah in verse 203 is talking about, remember Allah during the specific number of days. This is talking about the fact that the believers were told that you must return to Mina after Muzdalfa. And over there they had to engage in the worship of Allah for three days. But Allah is saying in this verse that there's no blame on a Muslim if they want to leave for Makkah just after two days. So, you know, they, they don't want to wait for the entire three days. They want to leave after two days. That's okay. Why? Again, Allah is teaching the rituals that were done according to Ibrahim alayhi salam because all of it has been distorted. All of it has been forgotten. So he's explaining from scratch what should be done, how it should be done, when and where it should be done, and for how long as well. Okay? Then verses 204 onwards, Allah says, And of the people is he, now this is interesting, of the people is he whose speech pleases you in this dunya. And he calls Allah to witness that uh, what is in his heart, but he is actually the worst of your opponents. And when he goes away, he strives throughout the land to cause corruption and to destroy crops and animals. So he tries and spreads fasad. And Allah does not like corruption. And when it is said to him, fear Allah, pride in the sin takes hold of him. So he's like, he's arrogant. Sufficient for him is Jahannam and how wretched is, is the resting place. And of the people is he who sells himself Seeking means to the approval of Allah and Allah is kind to all of his servants. O oh, you who have believed, enter into Islam completely. Do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Allah is saying that again. Indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. But if you deviate after clear proofs have come to you, then, Allah, then know that Allah is exalted in might and wise. Now here Allah is talking about self-righteousness. The disease of self-righteousness that can make you become that can make you go from being a muttaqin to a munafiq. Okay, hypocrisy. Do you remember hearing verses like this before? That these are people whose speech are amazing, they say amazing things, but when they are told, don't do fasad, they say, uh, we are the ones who are actually doing right things. We're not doing fasad. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was introduced for the munafiq. Here yeah. Allah is saying the same thing. They go around and they do corruption, and when they're told, fear Allah, then they become arrogant and proud. So let me give an example. These are people whose speech is like, you know, they'll go around saying, oh, I love Allah so much. Oh, I cannot, you know, uh, I would never uh, do things that are wrong and, and bad because I know that my God is watching me. And they give these amazing public speeches and so on. And, you know, to tell people that this is how pure and amazing my heart is. My heart is filled with the love of God. They try and project this image. But Allah says in the background, they are spreading corruption and facade. And Allah is saying, I, don't, I do not like corruption. And when they're caught red-handed and they're told, what are you doing? Fear Allah. You know, on the one hand, you're giving these speeches. And then on the other hand, what are you doing? Then sin, then arrogance and pride takes hold of them. They say, how dare you tell me that I'm doing something wrong? Do you know how much love there is in my heart for God? Do you know what an amazing, pious and righteous person I am? And you have the audacity to tell me that I'm wrong and I should fear Allah. You should fear Allah. Okay. Now, again, who is uh, behaving like that? Iblis. That's why Allah says, don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Because Iblis was always worshipping Allah, always praising Allah, always following Allah's commands. But the one command that came and he didn't like, he went against it. That's like spreading corruption. That's like spreading facade. And when he was told, what are you doing, Iblis? When Allah said, you know, what are you doing? What did he say? He didn't say, oh, I'm so sorry, Allah. Oh, what a huge mistake I made. Right? Instead, he gave a justification. And then he said, okay, Allah, since you have done this to me, let me prove to you that your insan is just is not better than me. In other words, I'm still right. This insan does not deserve my prostration. You, Allah, you are wrong. I'm right. Let me prove it to you. So when you get into that mode where you're constantly arguing with the other person, no, how could you say this to me? No, I'm right. No, you are the one who's wrong. I'm going to prove it to you. That's a bliss. 
Okay? Instead, what Allah is saying is that the person who is righteous, instead what he does is he, is, he sells himself to seek the pleasure of Allah. So he's always trying to do good deeds and stuff. And if someone says, oh, you've, you just did something wrong, fear Allah. He immediately does tawbah. He immediately starts to examine himself and says, okay, maybe I did do something wrong. Right? He has that humbleness and that humility inside of himself, always holding himself accountable. Okay? Then in verse 210, Allah says, Do they wait but that Allah should come to, come to them in, in clouds and the angels and the matter should then be decided and to Allah all matters are returned. In other words, what is Allah saying over here? And who, who do you think he's addressing? Well, I cannot understand it because it's like a, it's not basic, uh, of the English form, it's like a poetic okay. form of English. Okay, let me, let me put it in simple English words. Allah is saying, are you guys waiting for Allah to come down in the clouds with all of the angels and so that the matter is then finally decided? And to Allah, all matters are returned. What? No idea. The, uh, is Allah talking to the uh, the Arabs, the the Arabs, or Bani Israel? He's talking to the kafirs. kafirs. Okay, he's talking to all the disbelievers, and he's saying, okay, so much evidence has been provided, so much proof has been provided, so many amazing verses have been provided. You guys are still attacking the Muslims. You guys are still not willing to believe. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for me to come down and, and me alongside the angels and then you will see me and say, oh Allah, now I believe. Is that what you're waiting for? Because when that does happen, guess what else is going to happen? It'll be too late for The day of judgment has started. Yeah. So now you cannot say, oh Allah, now I get it. Now you're too late. And this is a beautiful verse for us Muslims too. You know when Muslims say, Oh, I really want to do my five time prayers, but I don't know. I'm just so lazy. It's so hard for me to do it. I really want to study study the Quran. I just don't have the time. I cannot even take out 10 minutes a day. I really want to do good deeds, but I don't know. You know, uh, shaitan has this hold on me. It's so hard for me to do it. Right? For them, this verse is amazing. Allah is saying, what are you waiting for? When is your procrastination finally going to end? Are you waiting for me to finally come down? Because when I come down, I will deal with it in a very different way. And then you won't have time. Okay? <clears throat> and then Allah says in verse 211, Ask the children of Israel how many a sign of evidence did we give them? And whoever exchanges the favor of Allah for disbelief after it has come to him, indeed Allah severe in penalty, Beautified for those who disbelieve is the life of this world. And they ridicule those who believe. But those who fear Allah are above them on the day of resurrection. Allah gives provisions to whom he wills without account. Now these are very, very important verses. First of all, Allah is now telling all of the polytheists that, you know, you guys keep asking for signs, right? Show us a miracle, show us a sign. How come this man Muhammad, peace be upon him, how come he cannot do the kind of miracles Musa could do and Isa alayhi salam could do? Because we've heard about it from the Jews and Christians, right? So how come he can't do anything? And so Allah is telling them, go talk to Bani Israel. Ask Bani Israel, how many signs and evidences did we show them? And how did their ancestors behave? Musa alayhi salam showed them a lot of signs. Isa alayhi salam showed them a lot of signs. How rebellious were they towards Musa and Isa? How rebellious were they towards all of their Nabis and all of their Rasuls? Right? And then Allah says, and when there comes to you an, any kind of a sign, an extra benefit, what is the cost of receiving that extra benefit? Of uh, 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 a really big test? A test? No. What's the benefit of seeing a huge miracle? Well, it's a day for God for you. Right. Uh, you for the benefit. Right. And so what is going to be the cost? That now you have to believe it because the punishment is going to be more severe. Now the punishment is going to be severe. So Allah is saying that there is a leniency being shown to the Ummah of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that leniency is that if I were to show you the miracles that were shown to the previous Ummah and you did not still believe in Allah saying, I know you still won't believe. You will say, oh, this is magic. 
this is sorcery this is my eyes uh, there's some kind of an, an an illusion or hallucinate uh, hallucination and then i'm saying then when you start doing that i'm going to have to give you punishments you've never seen in this world before so don't ask me for those kinds of miracles i'm doing you a benefit by not showing them to you okay and most importantly what you see over here is amazing allah says beautified for the kafirs is dunya ha huh. and they ridicule those who believe mm-hmm. what does that mean uh, basically uh, the people who will still not believe in the message uh, for them uh, the punishment is to give them a lot of dunya so they can get so attached to it that they don't have uh, a very small amount of hope of uh, a small amount of chance of coming back to islam so do you remember that expression i gave you in the quran in surah baqarah in the beginning an expression which involved rope ha uh, allah gives them rope gives them rope which means allah says all right i've opened up the gates of all good things enjoy mm-hmm. so if you are someone whose life is filled with tests and hardship what does that mean that um you are not on the wrong path that you are on the right path you're on the right path yeah. are you on the path towards allah or the path towards jahannam the path towards allah so if your life is filled with hardship does that mean allah hates you or allah loves you loves you now you get it uh-huh yeah? yeah because if you are constantly being tested allah is constantly using those tests and difficulties to purify you, you improve your iman make you a better person and through the pain and the grief and the tears he is removing your sins because he always compensates so if you spent hours crying because of your test allah will use that to remove sins but if he gives you all good things then you have to be careful then perhaps you you're not on the path towards allah okay and that's why allah says i make this dunya so beautiful for the extreme kafirs then those who really are hell bound on going against me those munafiks who are hell bound on becoming an enemy of islam i make dunya great for them go ahead and enjoy i'll just catch you once then verse 213 allah says mankind was one religion then allah sent prophets as bringers of good tidings and warners and sent down with them the scripture in truth to judge between the people concerning that in which they differed and none differed over the scripture except those who were given it after the clear proofs came to them out of jealousy and animosity amongst themselves allah guided those who believed to the truth concerning that over which they had differed by his permission and allah guides whom he wills to a straight path in other words since the beginning of time all of mankind has been one has belonged to one religion worshiping one god so since the beginning of the time it's been one message it's not judaism christianity and now islam it has always been islam it's always been one deen but allah says what happens is slowly what creeps in every single time uh, of idol worship idol worship every time and do you remember why i told you idol worship always creeps in Be- yeah why? because they are these uh priest and rabbis who want, want a pa- power what power good power so, struggle the power struggle is what always uh, uh, causes idol worship to jump in somehow or the other okay this idea that they want to worship a god they can see and then priests uh, uh, um this uh, this nation of priests start to arise then they want power and so on and allah says whenever that happens then i send a prophet and i send a kitab to teach people no this is wrong you have to go on the right path and he says the people i send the book to they are the ones who end up going against it in other words the priests and the priests and the rabbis and so on they say okay well allah has now sent a book which is making things very clear and it is stripping us of our power so we have to distort the book hide the book go against the book or if there is a messenger who is now calling us out and telling the the world that these people are you know, distorting okay, the kill message him. kill him or say that oh he's possessed by a demon he's possessed by a jinn like this like like they said about you know who they said this about uh no isa alayhi salam because isa alayhi salam the miracles were just outstanding they were amazing so 
the, the rabbis knew he was the promised Messiah, and they said, no, no, he's possessed by a demon. He's possessed by a jinn. This is all magic that he's doing. So as a result of that, what Allah is saying is that every time I give you a scripture, the people who are given the scripture are the ones who end up going against it because of jealousy, hatred, animosity. And the last example of this is the Ummat of Bani Israel. They were given Isa salam, they were given a scripture, it made everything very clear. And then you had jealousy which caused the Ummat to split between Jews and Christians. And now Allah is saying the same thing is happening with you guys. You guys were all in a period of ignorance. I gave you a prophet. I gave you a kitab. I made everything so clear to you. And amongst you now, because the book was given to the Arabs, right? They were the primary target audience. And then the Arabs themselves split amongst each other. They started to kill, kill each other. They started to hate those who followed the prophet. And so war and bloodshed started. And Allah says, this is how it's always been. Yeah. But... Uh, the religion of uh, Christianity, basically, uh, they believe that Isa al-Islam, he was uh, killed uh, on, oh, you know, when he was... Uh, Crucified. Yeah. But uh, you can't actually blame them because the person who... Um, was killed. No, yeah, the person who was killed was not actually Isa al-Islam, uh, but his face was changed so that it looked exactly like Isa al-Islam. Correct. So you cannot, uh, that's why they primarily believe that he, he was crucified. Okay, now there's, so, so you can't there's an answer to that question. That answer is when you look at the Gospels of the disciples of Isa al-Islam, <coughs> like the Gospel of Barnabas, okay, those Gospels mention that Isa was never crucified. Those Gospels mention that Isa was raised. Remember that story I told you about how um, Isa alayhi salam, the, the roof suddenly was, uh, there was light coming and Isa alayhi salam was raised and then yeah. the other disciple. Where did I get this information from? The Quran? No. Uh, the, uh, uh... the Bible. The Gospels of Barnabas. The Gospels of the disciples. So their own Gospels are telling us that Isa was never killed. Isa alayhi salam was raised. No, but, uh, oh, oh, but if, it, uh, if it's in the gospel of, of Barnabas, right? Uh, the modern Christians... They have altered it, right? That That's where distortions come in. So, so how is it the they part have... of the Christians who've come, who were born after the It's gospel? not, which is why the Quran has now come. Do you remember in the previous lectures, all those times when Allah said, they are a nation that has passed away, they will be asked about what they did, you will be asked about what you did. Do you remember? Yeah. We kept seeing that verse. So Allah, the reason he sent the Qur'an then was that, okay, fine, they have distorted it. You are a new generation. Now use your aql, here's a book, study the messages, it tells you about the distortions. No, uh, but in the Qur'an it does not tell about how that his face was changed for it to be the other person and then... Right, but the Qur'an tells you he wasn't crucified, right? So what you do is, as a Christian, you start saying, okay, he wasn't crucified. How come my book says he was crucified? Why don't I go and study the Gospels of the disciples? If I, as a Muslim woman, if I can access those, uh, those Gospels and read it, why can't a Christian? No, but they have been uh, distorted now. No, they've not. I just told you the Gospel of Barnabas mentions that he was never crucified. It's available everywhere. So now it is up to you to do the research and see that, okay, the Qur'an is saying this, but the Gospels of the disciples who were living with Isa alayhi salam, they mentioned this story. In fact, the entire story of Jesus being crucified came centuries later. Centuries later, they came up with this idea that, oh, he was crucified, he died on the cross. Do you know that? It's not something that initially started over there. So the people who were living with Jesus, the, the disciples, why don't you read their books? They were there with him, right? Mm -hmm. Why read the books of people who were never there with Isa, who came hundreds of years later? Right? This is where the akal kicks in. You start to ask really important questions like what you're doing, and then you start doing the research, and then you say, none of this makes sense. There's something really wrong with Christianity. You get it? Okay. Then verse 214, Allah says, Or do you think that you will enter Jannah while such test has not come to you as came to those who passed before you? They were touched with poverty and hardship and were shaken 
until their messengers and those who believed said, when is the help of Allah going to come? And unquestionably, the help of Allah is near. Now this is the most beautiful of all, of, of all the verses. All of them are beautiful, but this one, it really hits you hard in the heart. Because <clears throat> what happened was, you have uh, the people in Mecca, right? The Muhajirin. They went from Mecca to Medina. In the 12 years that they faced in Mecca, was their life beautiful no. and amazing? No, it was pretty tough. Oppression, torture, killing, slaughter, all kinds of things were Not happening. Burned. Their, the back, their backs had been burnt. Uh, there was one of the Sahabas who would be tied to a horse and he would be dragged all around for hours until they thought, okay, now he's definitely dead. And they would do that to him continuously. Okay? That kind of torture used to happen. Right? People's parents would be killed in front of them and they would be told, now say something bad about the Prophet and leave Islam. So they did not see a life of bliss. Right? But when Islam started to spread in Medina, the Muhajireen have seen a tough life, so they know what tests and trials are like. They're used to it. Who's not used to it? But Israel. No, we're talking about the Muslims. Christians. We're talking about Muslims. Uh, 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 the people with the command. No, no the, uh, the Arabs who, who are in Medina who Ansar. Embrace, uh, embrace Islam. Ansar, yes. The Ansar had not seen that kind of oppression because for them, the Prophet has arrived in Medina. The entire Medina has embraced the Prophet. Everyone has become Muslim. It's great. There's no torture and persecution happening over there. So for the Ansar, what some of them started to believe is that now we have embraced Islam. There's a head of state. We have a Nummat. Everything is going to go amazing for us now because we are following God. But then the tests started to come. The problem started to come. Battle of Uhud, you face defeat, right? Constant enemies attacking you and trying to fight you and trying to kill you. And they started to think, why is Allah not helping us? Why isn't our life supposed to be perfectly easy now? There was even a time during the Prophet, Prophet's life where there was a famine. There was hardly anything to eat and drink. So the question became, what's going on over here? Why is our life so difficult? Right now, for the Muhajireen, they know it; they've seen it. But for the Ansar, it was just—it was hard for them to understand. For some of the Ansar, and that's why Allah is telling the Muslims: Listen, did you think you'll be able to get Jannah just because you said I believe? That's it. I have yet to test you the way that people in the past were tested, and they were tested so severely that the uh, the believers and the prophets would say, uh, "The prophets, by the way." Even the prophets would cry out, Allah, when is your help going to come? They reached the point where their hearts were on the verge of cracking and breaking. And Allah responds by saying, listen, indeed, the help of Allah is always there. Relax. I've got your back. Okay? This is what they were being told. This is what we are being told. You will face times in your life where your test will become so much that even you will break down and say, Allah, enough. Allah, please enough, I'm, I'm finding it hard to even breathe right now. Life has become so hard. And Allah is saying, well, the tests are there to expose your iman, to build your iman, to make you a better Muslim, to teach you tawakkal, to teach you that, okay, life is horrible right now, but listen, things will still get better. A door will still open because, hello, Allah is saying, I'm still here. Dunya can leave you, I won't leave you, I'm still here. Okay, and this is where I want to discuss with you the beautiful stories of Musa salam and Muhammad peace be upon him. Musa salam was a man who did not like any kind of injustice. Okay, we'll study about his story, but you must have, you must remember the time when um, he got into a fight. Yeah, yeah. he he accidentally killed a, uh, a person. He accidentally killed a person because he saw a man, uh, an Egyptian local. And he saw a member of Bani Israel and they both were fighting. And he assumed that the Egyptian must be the oppressor. Yeah. And the poor guy from Bani Israel, he must be the one who's the victim. So he jumped in to try and stop the fight and he was trying to control the Egyptian. And he punched him, but by mistake, the, the guy died on the spot. Okay, now why is Allah telling you this? Because it tells you something about Musa. He sees fights, he sees injustice or oppression. 
He cannot stop himself. He has to jump in and he has to fix it. He cannot stand any kind of injustice. Now, Allah knew. Can a leader like this lead a ummah of 600,000 people who are always rebellious and who are always going against the Prophet? No. What will he keep doing? He will keep trying to... Uh... You know, bring justice into each and every problem and each and every fight that they have. He'll keep losing his patience. Yeah. He'll keep losing his temper. He'll keep getting aggressive. And when you're a leader of an ummah, if you're going to keep getting angry, what's going to happen to, uh, to your ummah? Uh, they will get angry at you. They will, they will leave Islam. So Allah said, okay, he needs to be trained. Allah is not going to just inject sabr inside of you. You have to learn it. So what does Allah do? Musa salam, comes back to the Pharaoh as a prophet, right? After almost 10 years. He comes back and he tells Pharaoh, okay, listen, I'm a prophet. You have to free Bani Israel, accept Islam, so on and so forth. What does the Pharaoh do in anger? No. Well, yeah, he says no. But what does he do to Bani Israel? He starts torturing and oppressing them. In specific, how does he torture and oppress them? He starts killing all the uh, boys. He starts killing all of the male babies. Newborn babies. And all of the newborn babies no, who are uh, male. No, but what, uh, wasn't that before? That was Remesis the first. Yeah. This is now his son, Remesis the second, in, in introducing the same punishment again. Oh. So all the male babies were killed in front of the parents. And the parents went running to Musa and said, Musa, come on, you're a prophet, do something. And when Musa prayed, Allah said nothing. Allah said, uh, face towards the Qibla and start praying. Now for a man who cannot stand injustice, he cannot stand two people fighting, you think he could stand something like this? No. And what, is it, what did Allah say? Do nothing. Do nothing. I will take care of it. Whoever is suffering, whoever is in pain, I will compensate them. You need to learn to leave it to me and trust me. You can do nothing. And when it reached the stage where after years, Allah now knew that, okay, now Musa has learned sabr, but now his heart is going to crack. It's too much for him. Plus, he's learned his lesson. He now knows sabr. Then Allah said, okay, now take the people and run to the sea. So now you've learned what you needed to learn. That's how Musa was able to lead a rebellious nation of 600,000 people and live with them in the desert for 40 years. Because he learned it. Let me give you a last example before we end. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay? When he's young, he has, he's doing his business. He has money. He has an amazing, an amazing wife. He is part of an amazing tribe. Great status and honor. He has a lot of protection. And at the same time, he has this great title that is being given to him. Sadiq Everybody, and Amin. Yeah, Sadiq and Amin. Everyone loves him. Right? When you have so many things... Does it make you weak or strong? Um, weak. It makes you weak, it makes you vulnerable. Because the more you have, the more you become dependent on those things. You've never seen life without those things. Mm. It makes you weak. Now Allah knew, I have to make this man a leader of an ummah. An ummah that will go on till the end of, of times. I This man has to lead battles like Badr and Uhud and the battle of Khandak. This man has to lead an entire army against the Byzantine Empire. He's got to be stronger. So, so, so what does Allah do? Till tw for 12 years in Makkah. Where for 12 years in Makkah, persecution. So what does Allah do? First of all, his wealth is gone. Slowly all the money is gone. Secondly, his status is gone. He's not called Sadiq and Amin anymore. He's called liar, sorcerer, magician. Stay away from him. People don't even like to look at him anymore. People who loved him now look at him with disgust. Then Allah takes away his most beautiful companion, his wife is gone. Then Allah takes away his, his, protection. Uh, his protection, his uncle is gone. Now his life is in danger. Then he decides, okay, let me go to Taif. Maybe I can, you know, spread Islam there. And then he's humiliated in a way that the entire Arab region is laughing at him. That children basically two, chased him out. And now he's stuck. He cannot go back to Taif and he cannot re-enter Makkah. 
He has to wait for someone to grant him protection and allow him to enter Makkah. He had nothing at the end of Taif. Everything he had was taken away from him. At that point, he had learned to live without anything. That is when he made that beautiful prayer to Allah, that Allah, I'm your messenger. What am I supposed to do? You've given more power to my enemy. And after that climax, then the doors of good things opened up. Then his entire city of Medina was being prepared and he didn't even know. Right? So this is what Allah is saying over here. You will face tests that reach a climax when you're on the verge of breaking down. It happened to prophets too. But it's a means of purifying you, improving your iman, teaching you more than you could ever imagine and making you attain your potential because Allah is preparing you for something great. All right. So let's stop over here, inshallah, and we'll continue with verse 215. Assalamu alaikum.